Don't be lame. Duly noted. Well, it's quite an honor to be standing here before you tonight. I, uh, I told Brother Fannin about four, five, six weeks ago I, I wouldn't mind preaching. I've got a sermon ready, and uh, you know, lo and behold, he does put you on the spot. <laughs> so, he gave me a, a heads up warning last night, and yep, today it's on. So we'll see what happens. Um, the title of my sermon tonight is Very Few Are Saved. Very Few Are Saved. And the part of the uh, scripture I want to focus on in the, in the reading in Luke chapter 13 tonight starts in verse 23. It says, Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut the door, and you begin to stand without and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, he shall answer and say unto you, I know not whence you are. Then shall you begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. Something that's always kind of uh, jumped out at me was that question. Lord, are there few that be saved? That's a curious question. And you ask yourself, why would, you know, what's, what's the point of asking such a question? Well, number, numbers are very important to us. They're very important to God as well. They give us perspective, all right? Numbers always tell the truth. We track numbers in this church. We track the number of baptisms. We track the number of everyone in attendance every time we get together. We track the number of salvations we have, right? Yeah. We're closing in on 500. Is that 473 plus 20 today? Yes, sir. So we're sitting at 493. Amen. All right? Amen. Seven shy away from 500. Amen. In the last four months, that's incredible. All right? And that's averaging about 125 salvations per month. Very good job, you know. But here's the thing. Numbers put everything into perspective. How many people live inside of Jacksonville, Florida? Anybody know? Right out of 850,000 or so. I checked it today. It's 913,000. 1% of that is 9,130. So, to break it down even further... So far, at around 500 salvations, we have gotten half of half of half of half of 1% of Jacksonville saved. <laughs> when we get 1% of Jacksonville saved, that'll be a huge deal. Yeah, it will. That'll be 9,130 salvations. Yeah. All right? So numbers put everything into perspective for us. And, you know, God obviously believes numbers are important to him. He, he wrote us an entire, the fourth book of the Bible, Numbers, you know. It's important to him, therefore numbers should be important to us. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> now, the first thing I thought of when I heard the news about the mega marathon on March 31st, 2018, we're having a mega marathon, my brain just started, right, what's the numbers going to be? 50 states, yeah. and I'm thinking conservatively, like, what's the, the least amount of salvations we've seen in some of these soul winning events? Like around 40 is kind of like the bottom number. I was like, even if we just did the minimum, hit 40 per 50 states, not including the territories like Guam and Puerto Rico and, you know, Canadians and, and everything else, I'm sure there's going to be people from Australia and the UK jumping in on the same day. Right. Yeah. But just 50 states times 40 salvations as a minimum baseline that's 2,000 salvations in one day right there you know so it, that's just the baseline I got a feeling it's going to be a lot higher than that yeah. but numbers are very important to us and that's just you know just something the way my mind works so when I read this passage in Luke 13 and, and the man asked the Lord Lord are there a few that be saved well he gets an answer and he says you know many will go into destruction. <coughs> and we get a, a little better <coughs> understanding when we turn to Matthew chapter 7. Let's go there now. Tonight I just want to focus on how many people are actually going to heaven. 
How many people are truly saved? And it's going to be kind of shocking, kind of surprising. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 7, look in verse 13. Jesus is talking and he says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now that word straight is the same word they used back in Luke 13. The word straight, as you can see, the spelling is a little different. It's not like straight, like straight as an arrow. It's talking about straight, like at the bottom of Florida. <coughs> Between Florida and Cuba, we have a little strait right there, a little little narrow passageway for boats and ships to cross through right there. That's what it's talking about. It means narrow, and it's defined in, in Matthew chapter 7. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, okay, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. What I'm curious to know is just how few are we talking about here? Now, if you were to go out and poll the public, if you were to walk up and down the streets, and you were to say, hey guy, do you think most people are going to heaven or hell? What do you think? What do you think their answer would be? Oh man, all dogs go to heaven and most people go to heaven. Only the bad, bad, bad people. Only the real bad people are going to hell. Right? Where do they get that from? Where's their wisdom coming from? Hollywood and whatever their brother said to them. You know, whatever. But we know the answer is right here. Luke 13, Matthew chapter 7. We already know that there's going to be few that are saved. Yeah. But just how few is few? You know, is it like a, is it a ratio breakdown? Is it like 51% are going to hell and 49% are going to be truly saved? What's the ratio? And I want you to be thinking tonight, we're going to be breaking this down, but I want you to be thinking, what do I think the ratio is of people that are truly saved and on their way to heaven What's the ratio? <clears throat> you know, obviously it says that straight is the gate and narrow is the way. What's the way? Jesus Christ. Yeah. John chapter 10 says, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the, the door of the sheep, and all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. John 14, verse 6 says, Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. That's right. Okay? So that's the narrow way right there. And uh, let's see. I want to show you all something. I'm not sure how, way, how well you're going to be able to see this. I've kind of got a little bit of a graphic to share with you all. I'm going to kind of point it around the room. But it's a pie chart. Colorful, color-coded pie chart. And maybe I can get something like this blown up and we can maybe post it somewhere. All right? But here's the thing. Jesus, we know, is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by Him. Yep. This is a pie chart of all the world's religion. Okay? okay? All the world's religion color-coded in a nice, easy-to-see graphic here. I want you to take notice if you can see this. All right? The green are the Muslims. The green all the way around to right here are atheists. This entire percentage of this pie chart accounts for 67% of the world's population. 67%. That means only 33% of the world's population actually cl claims the name of Jesus in some way, shape, or form. All right? So just based off of this pie chart alone, that already makes Jesus' statements true. Yeah, 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 that's right. He says, few to be the same. You know, well, a 33-67% ratio is very true. Yeah, okay? Yes. But what I really want to focus on tonight is the 33%. The 33% of everybody that actually claims Jesus in some way, shape, or form, I want to go through them and dissect them and see exactly just how close to 33% we actually are. Okay? Now, the exception proves the rule, and I'm going to probably have to remind you a few times tonight. I don't want people getting upset and running out, you know. Well, my aunt was a so-and-so, you know, you're calling her unsaved or whatever, but the exception proves the rule. I believe that there are people inside of this 67% wedge right here, this huge part, that are actually truly saved. Okay? 
If you got a teenage boy saved in Saudi Arabia that belongs to a Muslim family, is he going to fill out on his little census card that he is a part of, you know, he's a Bible believing Baptist Christian? No, not at all. That doesn't take away his salvation by no means, okay? So the exception proves the rule, but we're going to kind of kind of look at this as a generality tonight and kind of look at our, uh, our 33% of everybody that claims Jesus and just kind of break it down. If you like math, if you're a nerdy type of person like me, you're going to really enjoy this sermon. If not, go ahead and check out. If I see you snoring, I won't take it to heart, okay? <laughs> it won't be that bad. So, Before we jump into this, though, we need to kind of lay some ground rules. We need to make sure we're all on the same page, which I think everybody in this room is. Um, three men's preaching nights ago, I was able to preach the sermon, God's Record, okay? Also known as the gospel. Right. <laughs> in order to be saved, you have to believe the gospel. Yeah, right. Amen. Turn to 1 John chapter 5, and let's just briefly go over that real quick. Okay, I think that's important. We're going to be looking at different Christian religious denominations tonight, and we're going to be able to determine are they saved or are they not based off of what their statement of faith is. Okay. Right. That's good. And we have to first define what is true salvation. Okay? So 1 John chapter 5, look in verse 10. It says, it says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. What is the record? Glad you asked. Verse 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. That's the record. You have to believe it. There's three components here. Yeah. And I'm not going to re-preach that sermon. It was about 15 minutes long. But I'm going to go over just the main basic points. Verse 11 says, And this is the record, and God hath given. Alright, that means it's a gift. It doesn't yeah. cost us anything. It's a free gift. That's right. God has given to us what kind of life? Eternal. Eternal life. Once you got it, it lasts forever. Okay. Yeah. There's no such thing as losing your salvation. If you're saved, you're saved forever. And this life is in His Son. You have to believe it's paid for by Jesus Christ. His blood on the cross, God Himself came down. He was a perfect sacrifice. He paid for all of our sins once and for all. Past, present, and future sins. You believe on Jesus Christ, you're given eternal life, you're saved. Amen. And that's it. And there's really no sense in complicating any further than that. When I got a chance to preach on men's uh, preaching night, I went through it and I found all these different verses in the Bible that back this statement up, John 3.16 and Romans 6.23, you know, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, and I just kind of went through and I showed all the different uh, references to this record of God or to his gospel. It's the same thing. You can either believe the gospel or the record. If you don't, the Bible says you're calling him a what? Liar. A liar. The opposite of trusting and believing is someone is to call him a liar. Okay? So, with that being said, I want to go ahead and, uh, and jump into this. So, 33% of the world's population, that is 2.42 billion people. 2.42 billion people claim to be Christians, and I'm going to use that term very loosely tonight. Christians, 2.42 uh, billion people, okay? Uh, what's the largest denomination? Catholics. That's it, the Catholics, right? We got any former Catholics in the house tonight? All right, my man. <laughs> Catholics, 1.285 billion people. That is 53% of everybody that claims the name of Christ made up Catholics, all right? 53%. What do Catholics believe? Okay. Now, I went through most of all these denominations, went straight to their biggest and baddest website and just copied and pasted, okay? I'm going to just read to you verbatim exactly what I found in their statement of faith, and, and you can make your own conclusions, okay? Catholics, the biggest of all denominations in the Christian world, uh, this is taken off of their FAQ, taken from catholicscomehome.org. What do they say? It says, the Bible says very clearly that we are not saved by faith alone. Wrong. <laughs> Works do have something to do with our salvation. Many Protestants believe that the only response necessary for salvation is an act of faith, whereas 
Catholics believe a response of faith and works is necessary. Scripture teaches us that one's final salvation depends on the state of the soul at death. As Jesus himself tells us, he who endures to the end will be saved. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Got that Matthew 24 screwed up, right? Yeah, yeah. One who dies in the state of friendship with God, the state of grace, will go to heaven. Yeah. The one who dies in the state of enmity and rebellion against God will go to hell. All right. So, based off of that statement, what do you think? What's the verdict? Oh, Are no. they condemned based off of them? Oh, yeah. oh, for sure, for sure. They do not believe in grace through faith. They believe in working their way to heaven. So, and uh, you're still in Matthew chapter 7, right? Yeah. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, look at verse 21. Remember, we're talking about the 33% tonight. The third of the world that claims Jesus Christ. Right. Yeah, I don't think y'all y'all were in Matthew seven, and I made you go to John First John five. Sorry about that. Uh, hopefully, you know your way back. Matthew chapter seven, verse twenty-one. Matthew seven twenty-one. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. And then I'll profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye all ye that work iniquity. All right, so we know that the works of God and the will of God are both defined in John chapter 6. I'm not going to run you over there and read it to you, but we've read that so many times, and that's what we show people. When everybody yeah. says, hey, you got to do the will of the Father to get to heaven, what is the will of the Father? Well, you got to obey the commandments, and you got to go to church, and you got to live right, and blah, blah, blah. We take them to John chapter 6. We show them what the works of God is, what the will of God is, and it's both the same thing. Yeah. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're given everlasting life. All right? All right. So I'm not going to run over that again. But listen, he's saying, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter. He's talking to Putin. He's talking to that 33%. Yeah, he is. Okay? He's talking to he's not talking to a Muslim. You know, Muslims give lip service to Jesus. All they do is say, Yeah, Jesus, you know, he was a great prophet. He came out of the womb walking and talking and speaking, and you know, he's cool, he's cool with us. But he's not God to them. You know, he's not God. They don't believe in, uh, in Jesus the way we do, and, and they just give him lip service, is all it is. So you're not going to see a, you're not going to see Muslims on Judgment Day standing before God, you know, and, and arguing and, and trying to boast and say, hey, Jesus, Lord, we did all this for you. No. He's talking to the Catholics. Yeah. He's talking to several other denominations that we're going to look at right now. Amen. All right. After the Catholics, anybody want to guess who's the next biggest and baddest out there? Church and Orthodox. Orthodox. I heard it. Yeah, Orthodox. Okay. Greek Orthodox. They're next. All right. <laughs> Greek Orthodox. All right. Eastern Orthodox. Who knows Hank Hanegraaff? Yeah. yeah, the Bible answer man. That Joker that Joker just flipped over and now he's all of a sudden he's a Greek Orthodox. Right. That guy's crazy. Right. I never trusted that guy. And uh, <laughs> don't believe anything he says. Alright? So taken from uh, Greek Orthodox of America at www.goarch.org, it says this is straight out of their stuff. There's three hundred million Eastern Orthodox out there. The reception of the gift of salvation is not a one-time event, but a lifetime process. St. Paul employs the verb to save in the past tense. We have been saved. In the present tense, we are being saved. And he's referencing 1 Corinthians 1.18. That's what the Bible don't say that. No, no, no. The Bible says you're saved. Yeah. With a D on the end. Amen. We're not being saved, all right? It's not a process. And it says right here, but it's a lifetime process. No, it's not. Once you're saved, you're always saved. All right? Eastern Orthodox are pretty much Catholic to a T. All right? um, I, the way they dunk their babies, they do them the triple dunks. You know, they, uh, they're, they're pretty much Catholic to a T. They, they don't believe in sprinkling. They believe in, in triple dunking the babies. And that's about the only difference. There's, there's really not much else. And uh, anyways, Eastern Orthodox are, are Catholic in, in a lot of senses out there. So... 
Next, we're going to hit on Pentecostals, all right? That's me, former Pentecostal standing right here, okay? So, what do Pentecostals believe? I could give you my version, but I'm just going to let them speak for themselves, okay? This is taken from uh, ag.org, assemblies.god.org. And uh, as the Pentecostals are made up of all kind of different factions, Assemblies of God, Church of God, Foursquare, Gospel Churches, all these kind of places. But it says, uh, taken from ag.org, it says, The Assemblies of God has taken a strong stand against the teaching that God's sovereign will completely overrides man's free will to accept and serve him. Okay. In view of this, we believe it is possible for a person once saved to turn from God and be lost again. You can't lose your salvation or have it taken away, but dot, 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 when you are saved, you turned to God. Turning to God means that you have committed your life to trusting and obeying God. In John 1, 6 through 7, it says, If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son, purifies us from us all. That's not the King James, by the way. According to this text, if we walk in the darkness, then we do not live by the truth. If our heart is not repentant when we sin, if our attitude is one of disobedience to the laws and commandments of God, if we turn away from God, if we live a life of sin, if we decide the effort to lead a godly life is not worth it, if the actions of our lives indicate that we no longer desire to be one of God's children, then we don't lose our salvation, and salvation isn't taken from us, but we, through our own free will, take our salvation and give it back to God. We tell God we don't want it, we give it up. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy, y'all. But yeah, I believed that for a long time. A long part of my life, I spent believing that. You know, you could lose your salvation or you could give it back or whatever they try to say. But uh, that's just not false. And I wasn't saved until I understood that. Okay, That's uh, 280 million Pentecostals. Okay, So we've covered Catholics, the 1.285 billion. We've covered the 300 million Orthodox and the 280 million Pentecostals so far. Who's doing the numbers in the head so far? All right. Remember, we started off with 2.42 billion out of that third. Next, we're going to talk about Anglicans, Episcopalians. In America, we call them Episcopalians. In England, they're Anglicans. They broke off from the from the Church of uh, from the Catholic Church. They broke off. Uh, Henry VIII wanted their divorce. The Pope said no. He said fine. I'm the new Pope, and I'm getting my divorce, and that's all that was to it. So. Uh, Anglicans are very much so Catholic in every sense as well. So they believe in several other things. And anyways, I don't want to indoctrinate you. Let me just let them read it for themselves. So this is uh, taken from Wikipedia. I couldn't find a good um, authoritative website for them for some reason. They're, don't you hate it when somebody's not clear about what they believe? Yeah. yeah. Bunch of cockroaches. It says... Uh, <laughs> All right. It says on the doctrine of justification, for example, there is a wide range of beliefs within the Anglican communion, with some Anglo-Catholics arguing for a faith with good works. I didn't know there was Anglo-Catholics to begin with, but that's what they are. And the sacraments. At the same time, however, some evangelical Anglicans ascribe to the reformed emphasis of sola fide, or faith alone in their doctrine of justification. That sounds good. Uh, see the Sydney Anglicanism. Still other Anglicans adopt a nuanced view of justification, taking elements from the early church fathers, Catholicism, Protestantism, liberal theology, and uh, latitudinarian thought. I can't even pronounce that. So what do Anglicans believe? Not, not grace through faith. It's not. Check it out. Um, I've met a few Episcopalians, and they're they're strange. Um, you have to research that. But there's 165 million of them running around, and they look. I've, I actually went to London um, on a college study abroad class back in 2004. We got to go to Westminster Abbey. Anybody ever heard of that? Very famous church. A lot of kings and queens and 
and, and who's who of society is buried in that floor of the church. You walk in there and you've got dead guys' names all over the place and you're just walking across it. And uh, we sat through one of their services. They, they brought out the choir boys that looked very much Catholic to me and they sang their songs and um, couldn't understand the sermon, the preacher or the, or the, the priest or whatever he did. Couldn't understand a lick of the words he was saying and they, they, the, the choir boys sang great and that was about all there was to it and we walked out of there. So very little doctrine at all is being preached there. And uh, that's probably the most famous church in their whole um, religion. So check them out. Anglicans. <clears throat> All right. Next we're going to talk about, anybody want to check it? Take a guess? What you got? Mormons. No, not Mormons. They're actually very small down on the list. There's not very many Mormons in here. Lutherans. That's what we're going to talk about next. Um, taken from lcms.org. This is a Q&A. Can you lose your salvation? And if you can, what do you need to do to regain it again? <laughs> Answer. The Lutheran Church believes and teaches that it is possible for a true believer to fall from faith. As Scripture itself soberly and repeatedly warns us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Peter chapter 5, 2 Peter chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 2, and 3 and 6, such warnings are intended for Christians who appear to be lacking a right understanding of the seriousness of their sin and of God's judgment against sin, and who therefore are in danger of developing a false and proud security based not on God's grace but their own <coughs> words, self-righteousness or freedom, to do as they please. By the same token, the LCMS affirms and treasures all the wonderful passages in Scripture in which God promises that He will never forsake those who trust in Christ and in Jesus alone for salvation. To those who are truly repentant and recognize their need for God's grace and forgiveness, such passages are powerful reminders of the true security that is ours through sincere and humble faith in Christ alone for salvation. A person may be restored to faith in the same way he or she first came to faith. So if you've lost your salvation, you can get it back by the same way you first got it in the first place, by repenting of his or her sin and unbelief and trusting completely in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ alone for forgiveness of salvation. Whenever a person does not repent and believe, this always takes place by the grace of God. Whenever a person does repent and believe, this always takes place by the grace of God alone and by the power of the Holy Spirit working through God's Word in a person's heart. What did that say you have to do in order to be saved? Repent, repent of your sins. Turn from a life of sin. And if you lost your salvation, how do you get it back? Just do it again. Rinse and repeat. That's how you get it back. All right. So that's Lutherans. Those are the Reformed. Those are the, the Protestants right there, okay? Those, that's John MacArthur for you. Yeah. Idiot. Um, Methodist. Methodist. 80 million. Methodist. Now here's the thing. Somebody's going to get upset and say, my aunt's a Methodist. I know she's saved. All right, the exception proves the rule. Let me throw right. out that disclaimer a few more times, okay? Yeah. All right, you might have an Aunt, an aunt Fruity Tootie that's a Methodist, right? And you've actually sat down from across the table and you've talked to her and she's got salvation right and she's 100% saved. That's great. But this is what the Methodists believe, okay? They also let women preach and they, they marry gays and everybody else together. So, you know, take it for what it is. <clears throat> Taken from umc.org. What do Methodists believe about salvation? Do Methodists believe once saved, always saved, or can we lose our salvation? A short but very incomplete answer is that our church teaches we can end up losing the salvation God has begun in us. And the consequence of this is in the age to come is our eternal destruction in hell. God freely grants us new birth and initiates us into the body of Christ and baptism. The profession of our faith and growth and holiness are necessary for God's saving grace to continue its work. Did you hear that? The profession of our faith and growth and holiness are necessary. If you're not growing and getting better, you're not, going, you're not getting saved. It's necessary for God's saving grace to continue its work in us. And both of these are things we must do for our love to be genuine and not compelling. We thus remain free to resist God's grace, to revert to spiritual 
torpor and possibly uh, experience spiritual death and hell as its consequence. The theology of John Wesley, however, follows more closely a different strand of theology in the Western and the Orthodox tradition that understands salvation as both something God does and in which we cooperate. Though not as equals by any means, only God can initiate salvation, but only by our ongoing living relationship with God through faith can God's saving intention be fully realized in our lives. Wow. I was kind of shocked about that one. I was like, Methodist, really? I mean, like, totally screwed up there. I really thought they were kind of on the same page, but it turns out they're, they're not. I learned something. You know, the Bible says when you teach, you learn to. So, Presbyterians, 50, 50 million. Taken from the Presbyterian Church in America, national website, PCAAC.org, what we believe, the good news. Presbyterians believe that once you are saved, then you are always saved. And that's correct. But the way for them to attain salvation is not biblical, uh, not biblical, and that they teach you must turn from sin in order to be saved in the first place. This is my notes I put in there. The false doctrine is starting to creep into a lot of Baptist churches as well. <clears throat> if God has done this in Christ, what are we to do to be saved? We must turn to God in Christ, which entails turning back from sin. If we repent of, decide to forsake and turn from our sin as best we understand it and trust in Christ as a living person, we will be saved from God's righteous wrath against our sins. This response of repentance and faith can be explained in more detail as follows. <clears throat> turning away from sin. Turning to God necessarily implies our turning away from sin. The whole Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, clearly teaches that to repent is to acknowledge God's name and turn from our sins. They need to study the word repent in the Bible a little bit better. A little bit better. I recommend a sermon for them. Repentance on salvation. Check it out. All right. So next we have the Latter-day Saints. 16.1 million. This is taken from the Book of Mormon. All right. Second Nephi, Nephi, chapter 25. Who cares? Verse 23, who cares? <laughs> Straight out of their holy book. This is what it says. For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. So they're saved by grace through faith. After all, they got through doing. So they have to, they got to push it as far as they can go, That's and then right. hopefully God will pick up the slack on their end, on the backside. <laughs> by the way, you know the Mormons and the Book of Mormon is the only place you'll ever find repent of your sins, yeah. and this is wow. for salvation. So when when somebody says you have to repent of your sins, I ask them, where does it say that? You know, I, can, I show you in the Book of Mormon. That's about it. So it usually offends a lot of people when they say that. <laughs> Who are we talking about next? We're talking about cult Christians now. I've only got uh, about three more to cover. <clears throat> Anybody want to throw it out? J Dubs. Oh, yeah. All right. The J Dubs. This is taken from Wikipedia. 8.3 million. By the way, that's, that's, that's small, y'all. I mean, that's, that's a very low number compared to all the other religions and denominations out there. 8.3 million Jehovah's Witnesses, only 16 million Latter-day Saints or Mormons. Jehovah's Witnesses teach that salvation, this is taken from Wikipedia, Jehovah's Witnesses teach that salvation is possible only through Christ's ransom sacrifice and that individuals cannot be saved until they repent of their sins and call on the name of Jehovah. Salvation is described as a free gift from God, but it is said to be unattainable without good works that are prompted by faith. Can't get saved unless you've got some good works to back it up. Okay. Um, and then the last but not least, uh, I want to talk about Baptists and the two little and two little side notes about them. Baptists. Anybody want to throw a number out? How many Baptists are in the world? Come on. Eight million? Eight million? You think we're outnumbered by the J-Dubs? Come on, man. Twenty-five million. One hundred and five million. 
105 million. Okay, I'll say them the last. <clears throat> this is my notes. Most Baptists believe in the free gift of salvation by placing their faith alone in Jesus Christ. They believe in the eternal security of the believer Amen. and that nothing can ever separate them from God once they are saved. Right. Taken from the Holy Bible, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And on the topic of eternal security, or sometimes referred to as once saved, always saved, John 3.16 tells us that, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Yeah. <clears throat> and hundreds of other clear scriptures. However, not all Baptists are cut from the same cloth. Okay? Yeah. Who's ever heard of a free will Baptist? Yeah. They, they should just X out Baptists. They're not Baptists at all. Right. Okay? Yeah. I don't even know why they creep in like that. Free will Baptists, taken from the National Association of Free Will Baptists. On the topic of salvation, man receives pardon and forgiveness for his sins when he admits to God that he is a sinner. When in godly sorrow he turns from them and trusts in the work of Christ as redemption for his sin. This acceptance of God's great salvation involves belief in Christ's death on the cross as man's substitute and the fact of God raising him from the dead is predicted. It is a salvation by grace alone and not of the works. Except you just told us that you got to repent of your sins. Anyways, who can be saved? It is God's will that all be saved. Amen. But since man has the power of choice, God saves only those who repent of their sin and believe in the work of Christ on the cross. Those who refuse in this life to repent and believe have no later chance to be saved and thus condemn themselves to eternal damnation by their unbelief. Perseverance. We believe that there are strong grounds to hope that the saved will persevere until the end and be saved because of the power of divine grace pledged for their support. We believe that any saved person who has sinned, whether we call him a backslider or a sinner, but has a desire to repent, may do so and be restored to God's favor and fellowship. Since man, however, continues to have free choice, it is possible, because of temptations, that the weakness of human flesh for him to fall into the practice of sin and to make shipwreck his faith and be lost. Free will Baptist, all right? They, nothing Baptist about them. <clears throat> and last but not least, I want to talk about inside of the Baptist denomination, the Southern Baptist Convention. Yeah. By far the largest of all, okay? Yeah. They are so screwed up and mixed up in the Lordship salvation, it's not even funny these days. Yeah. They believe you got to repent of your sins to be That's saved. Right. They believe, you know, you have to surrender your life to Christ in order to be saved. Yeah. you got to give Him all. I thought salvation was a gift. I thought that's what He gave us. Yeah. You know, they believe you got to lay it all down for Christ and put it all on the line for Him. So I'm not going into them, but that's the largest sect of all of Baptist denominations, and uh, they're, uh, they're totally screwed up. <clears throat> so... Who's been counting? If you haven't been counting, I want to tell you. Out of 2.42 billion people in this world, according to Wikipedia and what I've been researching, that's a third of the world's population claims Jesus in some way, shape, or form, right? We just accounted for 2.38 billion. That means there's 40 million running around out there that I haven't tracked down, okay? And I'm not going to because I can spend three times as much time tracking down those last 40 million. These are people like the, the, the Amish and the Mennonites and yeah. all the non-denoms out there. And I'm not going to chase all those squirrels down for you. But there's about 40 million unaccounted for Christian sects that I'm not going to look into, okay? That's good enough for government work for me. Um, and I do work for the government. So, let's see. If we were to be very generous, extremely generous, and let's just say that all Baptists, 105 million Baptists, all of them are saved. All right? If we were to be that generous and say they're all saved, guess how much the world's population is saved? Less than 1%. 1.3%. If all Baptists, if you got Baptists in the name anywhere, 1.3%. Obviously, that's, that number's way high, okay? 
So, I believe we're we're seriously looking at a less than one percent of the world's population is actually saved. <clears throat> and you might be saying to yourself, "Well, uh, surely there's got to be more than one percent. Surely there has to be more than one percent of the world's population that's saved." Turn to First Kings in your Bibles, please. Turn to First Kings, chapter nineteen. That's 1 Kings chapter 19. Look in verse 14. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain the prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on the way to, to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. Skip on down to verse 18. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, <clears throat> and every mouth which hath not kissed him. All right, 7,000. Very popular. Everybody's heard that before. 7,000 knees have not bowed to Baal. Guess how many people were living in that in that day and age in, in the nation of Israel back then? Millions. Okay? Millions. But even if we were conservative and just saying one million was living in that day and age in that nation, forget the fact that a million came out of Egypt or more. But this is hundreds of years later. If you got seven thousand, seven thousand that have not bowed the knee to Baal, seven thousand people that are saved, I guess we'll give them the benefit of a doubt they're all saved. That's less than 1%. All right? wow. Out of a million people, that's less than 1%. Um, not even close to 1%. But you say, surely there are more people saved than just 1%. Or you say, God is too loving. God is way too loving to destroy 99% of the world's population. Who remembers uh, a story about a place called Sodom and Gomorrah? How many people walked out? Four. Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. Well, you know what happened to the, to the wife, right? Yep. So really three survived, okay? Three came out. Now, most people don't realize this, but there were actually four cities destroyed, all right? There was, uh, if you go back in Genesis and look into it, there was five cities of the plain of Jordan, okay? Five cities, all but four of them, I mean, all but one of them was destroyed. The names of them were Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zebulun. Okay. Now Lot came up out of Sodom and he went into Zor and that's where he asked God if he could stay there and God granted him permission to stay there. Okay. Uh, so he went to Zor, also known as Bela, and four cities were wiped out. Four people came out, four cities were wiped out. What do you think the ratio of the people living in the city versus the people that came out alive were? I mean, these were called cities, not towns. All right. All right. That's we got about a million people living here in Jacksonville. I don't think it was quite that many. But I think there was a lot of people living in those cities that were destroyed. That God poured hellfire on top of them. You know, just think about these things. If you think, well, you know, that's, that's, that's just one isolated incident. Well, how about a worldwide flood? Yeah. Yeah. How many people came out of that? Eight. Eight. The whole world was destroyed. All right, eight. Let's turn to 1 Peter. 1 Peter, chapter 3. Eight people. The entire world destroyed. First Peter, chapter 3, verse 20 reads, Which sometime were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, Eight souls were saved by water. Skip over to uh, 2 Peter, chapter 2. Just a few pages. 2 Peter, chapter 2, verse 4 reads, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them unto the chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon 
the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. <clears throat> Don't tell me God's not above destroying 99% of the population. Yeah. Yeah. All right? God's not a respecter of person. Amen. He can do whatever he wants to. Right. In fact, he's already done it a few times. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And he's going to do it some more. He's going to keep on doing it because God never changes. Yeah. We'll always change. You know, the world is always just going to keep going in that same sinful pattern. But God's, God's going to show us again what he's going to do. So why are we discussing this topic tonight? Why in the world? I'm not trying to puff you up. I'm not trying to say, all right, congratulations, you made it. All right, yeah. good job. You're, you're less than 1%. I'm not trying to pat you on the back, even though when you think back on it, you're like, thank you, God. You know, yeah. you should have a, a heart that says, thank God. I didn't get raised to be a Methodist. Thank God I'm not, you know, trapped in some Mormon religion cult, you know. Thank God. But why am I bringing this up? Because I want to show you the need, that's why. Let's go to uh, John. This will be our last place. John chapter 4. Uh, see, I'm a very suspicious person. When I go door knocking, when I go soul winning, I know that 99% of the people that I'm walking into are not saved. Yeah. I know that when I'm knocking on their door and I hear the TV, the TV's blaring and I hear it get turned down or get cut off and I hear the footsteps coming to the door, I know there's only two inches of wood between me and an unsaved person. Yeah. All right? I'm a very suspicious person. You know, who's ever heard the phrase, you know, you're innocent until you're proven guilty? <laughs> it's the exact opposite with me. You're, you're, you're guilty until you're proven innocent or you're unsaved until you're proven to be saved. Amen. That's good. I don't want to give anybody the benefit of a doubt. Yeah. I'd rather be overly suspicious, overly cautious, and give them the gospel anyway. You know, um, you have to really convince me that you're saved before I pack up my Bible and say, have a good day. I want to make double dog sure. Um, I think that's a, a healthy approach, a healthy attitude to have. I don't think it's uh, borderline pushing the conspiracy theorist cart, you know. I don't live in a bunker and I don't wear aluminum foil over my head, but I think it is a healthy way to kind of go about this and kind of view everything. Everybody's a suspect, you know, you got to get them saved. And, um, and here's the thing, when we say 1% or less than 1% are saved, that's what I believe. You can take whatever you think. I, I, I think I kind of laid it out pretty clear tonight, but um, if you were to go door knocking like we do in uh, Saudi Arabia, you're not going to see anybody saved. I mean, you're, you, you, you're you not going to bump into anybody that's already saved is what I'm right. trying to say. Okay, Around here, you will. Around here, you'll, you'll find somebody that's already truly saved. But how rare is that? It's very rare. All right? It's extremely rare. <clears throat> and so, you know, the, we might have a, a little different number, a little different percentage around our parts in the Bible Belt. We do bump into people that are saved. Uh about every day, you know, but you have to knock a lot of doors to find them. And um, so I, I don't want to give people the benefit of a doubt. I would rather be overly suspicious and walk away still scratching my head uh, and just say, instead of saying, you know what, I think they were saved. You're good. You know, if they don't want to talk to me, I just go ahead and say, golly, I missed an opportunity. You know, and they, they shut me down. They, they're not rejecting me. They're rejecting God. But, yeah, that's right. you know, that's how I approach it. And uh, I think this kind of changes our perspective a little bit when we go out there and thinking, you know, the majority of the world is unsaved and on their way to hell. It changes our perspective. Yeah. And uh, it forces us to, you know, to be a better soul winner. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I think that's really the, the whole point of this matter. The, the, the reason why I preach this tonight, I want us to be better soul winners. And I think we do a great job. I mean, the numbers are proving it. And um, we're almost half of half of half of half of 1% of Jacksonville saved, so that's pretty good. So, um, I, I, so I definitely believe there's a need. And the last place I want to pray, uh, turn to is uh, John chapter 4. You should be there. <clears throat> and it says in verse 35, John 4, 35, it reads, Say not ye, they are yet four months, 
then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are already white in the harvest. They are white already to harvest. I don't think Jesus is lying there. Yeah. He said, few there be that are saved. Yeah. Okay. Just how few? I think less than 1%. Yeah. That's just my goal. I mean, that's just, that's just what I believe. And uh, our goal is to change it. So, right. Amen. Let's do it. Few there be that are saved. And look around. The fields are white under harvest. So let's pray. Amen. Dear Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to get to preach in this great church. I thank you for the, the men and women that make it up. Lord, we try to, our best to, to serve you and to do your will. We ask that you just guide us and put us in front of the right people to give them the gospel, Lord, to see them saved under, under your kingdom. We ask that you just lead our footsteps, Lord, as we try to do our best to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.